So here recently, Gen G made their land debut at DreamHack Open Anaheim, and it was a surprising debut, very impressive debut, as they wound up winning the tournament, and they didn't drop a single map along the way. That's right, they 2-0'd the group stage against Ensign Cole, then they went on to get 2-0s over North Inferia to go ahead and hoist a trophy. Now, it is true that many of these maps were close. I mean, a lot of them were either 16-13 or 16-14 type games. In fact, pretty much all of them were, with the exception of one of the maps they beat Furia on in the finals, which was the uh, opening map on Nuke, which they won handedly. But nonetheless, they still did win every single map, and so that is to be applauded, especially considering the fact that I don't think there were any big expectations for Genji at this tournament. I don't think that they were a favorite by any stretch of the imagination. I think that there were many other teams on that team list that were more likely to win the tournament in most people's eyes, including myself. You know, when I looked at the tournament, you're thinking, okay, uh, Complexity just came off a really hot tournament at Blast where they upset Astralis, and they looked pretty strong, actually. Some of their individuals were shining, and so I felt like Complexity came into the tournament despite their woes in the open qualifiers for Rio in an online environment, coming back into LAN after Blast, that they would actually, you know, look pretty strong. You know, you're hoping that maybe Ensign made Brazil finally recover after, you know, having so many struggles at the end of last year. And then you're hoping that maybe MSL with a bit more time at North has concocted something that would help them do a bit better than they did at their debut in Leipzig. So, so maybe you put a little bit of weight on them. And then, hell, Force was actually, I think, a good shout as well. They were a team that had a couple of pretty solid results at the end of last year. They were able to retain their talent and Z-Power and Flit and not let those guys go over to Navi. And so they still presented, I think, a pretty good case that they could even do something, you know, fairly impressive coming into this tournament. But none of those things happen. Instead, you had Gen G coming in, who we didn't really know anything about because they haven't really played anything together since Bentet joined the team outside of the qualifiers for this LAN event. They did play the Anaheim qualifiers with Bentet, where they beat Chaos and Riot Squad. And then other than that, they had played with Sick as a stand-in for, I think, the Katowice and Leipzig qualifiers, neither of which they were able to qualify for. Now... They were coming into this tournament with a long boot camp, from what I could gather from different interviews and just chatting with them. Apparently, they had a 14-day long boot camp once Bentet arrived, and they were able to really drill down those 14 days. They didn't take any days off. They apparently were playing a bunch of scrims every single day, and as well as just, you know, crunching maps and coming up with things. And so... That certainly played, you know, a, a role and an advantage maybe that they were at least come as prepared as possible. But again, you still couldn't expect much given that they had just gotten bent at. They didn't really have any reps together in official matches. And if we're honest, you know, the roster, when it first got announced, which I did a video on, I mean, th there was some great things about it, but there's also a lot of question marks. You know, for one, the core of Kusta, Daps, and Automatic played together on Cloud9 with Mixwell and Tens, and then er, Tens obviously temporarily replaced by Sub Rosa until that team fizzled out. Didn't say there was a long-term future there anyway when Sub Rosa showed up. It was kind of a, a rough opportunity for him. But anyway, that core played together on Cloud9, and they did not do well. I think they had, like, three map victories, three ties, and 16 losses. You know, it was not a, a pretty record in like the few events they attended. Now, granted, many of their losses were to really good teams like Liquid or EG or 100 Thieves, but they also struggled to some teams that they probably should be able to beat, including a team like E-United and then Fury, who was also struggling at the end of last year, where you thought, hey, if they have some talent, they have some, some potential, they should at least be competitive in these games, maybe get some wins, and maybe at least, you know, get out of a group stage, make a playoff run, something along those lines. But none of those things really happen. And, and so now they're coming together as a core three, and they're changing two players with Ben Tet and Som. But again, there was this transition phase where they didn't have Ben Tet. They were having to play with Sick. And then Som, if we're honest, I don't think there was really a good read on how good Som could be on this team. Because all that we had saw with Envy was fairly disappointing. I mean, he had a couple of good games against like Fury and Made in Brazil and some of the EPL group stage games. But outside of that, most of his performances were a bit lackluster or just kind of average. He didn't really have much experience. And so, while I think it was unfair to assume that he was going to be bad and that he had no potential at all to develop as a player, I think that is, is a bridge too far to, to critique him that harshly because I don't think Envy was a great environment. I think we're seeing a plenty of evidence of that in the aftermath of Psalms, you know, leaving the team or dismissal, whatever the case it was. I believe he left on his own because he got an offer from Jin G. I don't think he was cut. But anyway, we've seen how that's really crumbled, and, and so I don't think that was an environment that he was going to thrive in anyway. But still, we didn't really know how good he could be. I mean, there was certainly some mechanical skill there, certainly seemed to have some drive, certainly seemed to be a very passionate guy. 
So I, I think that there was some hope for him, but but it was really hard to know how good he would be, right? And it's still hard to know how good he's truly going to be long term. Obviously, he had a really great event in Anaheim, which we'll talk about, but it's still hard to kind of know what his ceiling is. And, and then you kind of throw that in there. And then with Kusta, I think he's a terrible support player. I think he's decent. I don't think he's ever going to be a star player. I don't think he's ever going to be a consistent high volume fragger. I think that his his chances of being a star are, are pretty much gone. But I think he's seems to be a glue player, seems to be willing to take spots that other people don't want, seems to be willing to do the grunt work, seems to work well on a team. I've heard a lot of compliments about him as a player from previous teams he's been on. I've heard some great things about him from the people playing with him on Gen G right now. I think Automatic even has some really great things to say about him, about, you know, what he's able to provide for the team uh, that maybe isn't you know, obvious on the servers, so to speak, but also some of the things that he's willing to do for people. I think that clip even went around where he jumped and grabbed a gun for another player, taking a bunch of damage in the process and dying, but then being able to grab the gun and pass it. I think it was to Bentet on Banana on Inferno. And because of that kind of selfless act, so to speak, Bentet wants a multi-frag and they want up winning that round. So there's little things like that that he's willing to do as well as playing the support roles. And he's pretty good in those roles. I don't think he was bad. I think he even showed some of that when he was playing with Steel over at Ghost, uh, kind of like last year and things of that nature and kind of going back even further. So, yeah, he I think he's serviceable, but again, I was kind of wondering where the firepower would come from because that's obviously isn't a big fragger. I didn't think Kusta would be automatic, had had his issues in the past uh, towards the end of Cloud9, but again, that was a bad environment also. But he was going to be coming into this team as a primary opper, which I don't think is his best role, but it certainly is a role he did play for Cloud9 for some time. And actually, there was a stint there where he was performing really well at the AWP, much better than I would have thought. It was actually quite impressive. So I was thinking if you get that automatic, and then maybe you also situations where you're running five rifle setups for certain executes and, and certain maps, then he could still be quite good. And, and so the hope was is that Bentet would come in and be a stud, Automatic would show us some of that level he was showing us on Cloud9 with AWP in the past, and that Sam would hopefully underneath that's his tutelage, you know, a guy who's able to bring in new and upcoming players and develop that talent and kind of teach them how to play within a system and kind of build that foundation that maybe that's what gets something out of a Sam that he wasn't get, that Sam wasn't getting elsewhere and that maybe Sam could develop into a strong player but the point is, is that there was a lot of question marks right I think it's fair to to think that this team was going to have a bit of a rocky start and, and might struggle to, to really get their feet underneath them but that's not what happened at all here at Anaheim again they they beat Ents in the opening map in a close game but they had like a really big CT side on Nuke they were able to beat Complexity on on Inferno. Here, they played well on both sides. Actually, start on the T side. They were able to get nine rounds, uh, including a 2-0 start because of the pistol. They trailed a bit there, but then they came back. They won like five of the last six rounds of the half. They 3 0 in, in the second half on the pistol as well. And they were able to, you know, roll that into a victory. The complexity certainly did grind back. They had like a run of six rounds in a row in their own right, made it a really close contest. I think it was actually tied 12 all at one point, but then Jinji were able to dig deep and, and climb their way out of that. You go into the, the North series, and again, they, they really dictated most of these games well. I uh, had a super strong T side dust two against North in the opening map of that series. Did struggle a bit in the start of the second half, but still were able to close out in the end to get the victory there. Then you roll over to Mirage. They started T-side again on this map. They had a pretty good T-side. Certainly, they were helped by the 3-0 start off of Pistol. But they were able to fit in a few gun rounds there and at least keep it like a close half, 8-7. And then their CT side was fantastic. And they won Pistol in that, too. So Pistols were actually really big for Gen.G throughout this tournament, it must be said. And then, yeah, they, they absolutely smashed Fury in the opening map. Again, they won both Pistols. They got 3-0 starts in both halves. They, again, had a strong CT side, just like they did against Instant in the group stage. And so things were looking great. And then Inferno, this was their one game that went into overtime. Again, they had a lot of 16-13, 16-14 victories along the way. But this went into OT. Again, they had a big T side on this Inferno. Did not win either pistol in this game, but they were able to jump immediately to a 3-1 lead after losing pistol. Controlled that T-side really well, got 10 rounds out of it, but then struggled a bit to close the game. Had to go into extra rounds, but still ultimately get the job done and get the title. And so, again, this is kind of a fantastic run from Gen G. They, they look great. When it came to player performances, Som was the clear MVP of the tournament. He was tied in rating with Poison at the end of the tournament. He was also within i think the top three for kd ratio i think he was like third or something like that he was also within the top five for damage per round kills per round then he was also ranked in the top five for you know opening kills opening kills per round and success in opening duels so 
basically was just an absolute stud throughout the tournament. So, I mean, this is a guy who really did a ton of great work. Automatic also had a really big tournament here. He was also ranked within the top five for, for KD ratio. He had really low deaths per round, so doing really great in that category. He was also doing great, you know, when it came to, like, op kills per round, total op kills. Uh, also great in his own right when it came to total opening kills and opening kills per round. So he was right there with Sam on being able to create openings at times or in rounds and, and get his team advantages and things of that nature. So really good statistical performances, particularly from those two players. But also, I have to say that Ben Tett was also super good. I don't think he ever really popped off maybe the way people were hoping for. But there's no denying that he played well in pretty much every game at this tournament. I mean, he was in the 20s pretty much every single map, uh, except for a couple of maps where maybe he was like in the mid-teens or something like that. But he had a lot of like really good mid to, mid to late round plays, including a couple of clutches and, and 1vx type scenarios where he definitely showed his ability to to really get the job done and kind of be that flexible rifler where he you know played a lot of solo positions on defaults and, and again because of that had to play a lot of mid to late round scenarios and really specialize in those moments but could still be used as a trade fragger and start executes and i think he's particularly important and even that's commented on this in, in the interview that you know he was important on their ct sides not only for being able to rack up kills but also being that guy that could kind of play with Sam. he's the more experienced player that comes with Sam and many of the bomb sites they they play together and, and could kind of create setups and create an environment where Sam could also thrive and they could play off of each other and so he definitely also had a really good event again kusta did his job played pretty well i mean i don't think you could really complain about his performance he's not meant to be a star he's not meant to be a heavy volume fragger but he still had plenty of games where he put up solid numbers and, and again played his role within the default you know being more supportive or just just kind of more like nitty-gritty positions that people don't really want to play that way you can facilitate you know other people like Sam, like bentet like automatic and things of that nature and so uh, good performances from from pretty much the whole entire team and, and when it came to the strategy of this team and kind of how it was it's going so far you know that's has always been known to be that in-game leader that really likes to build that default as a foundation of the team and find roles for people and make sure that they have that default established that they know what everyone's going to do at the start of each round you know kind of understand you know where they want to take control at who's going to be leading that control what utility is going to be used what you know protocols are going to be in place and, and he's also really good at using consistent utility to kind of mass movements like on you know, mirage for example consistently smoking catwalk and window to kind of keep people guessing what they're actually going to be up to and then he could throw in those pacing changes there were a couple of times where he would throw in like these screeny dry hits into a site with four or five players in the first 20 seconds of the round to throw off the other team you know like a couple of b tunnels rushes on dust two for example that they did i think to north uh that i remember and, and just little things like that or throw in some set pieces with good utility they had like a really good execute on mirage where they made sure everything was molotov like they molotov sandwich they molotov underneath balcony they molotov the bench so that they couldn't push smokes from jungle so, so they had all their bases covered on some of their set pieces as far as utility usage goes and then i think they had a really great system where again they had bentet playing these solo positions like, you know, long A on Dust2, for example, or, you know, playing, you know, B apartments on Mirage, but they also found ways to use him more actively in certain set pieces or certain just, you know, executes in. On a map like Inferno, he's playing B control with Sam, and so he's very active on that map, actually taking kills and creating openings and getting map control. So I think they balanced him quite well because what this allowed was to have an experienced player playing these positions where individual decision making is very key. And what this meant was is that someone like Sam, who isn't as experienced could still use his mechanical abilities but be tethered to someone like that who could kind of set him up and make sure that he didn't have to make so many like really tough pressure individual decisions that you know he could just kind of pair up with taps do some entry work do some map control grabbing and, and it was kind of just set up to succeed which i think is a great way to to use someone like Sam. and again Sam was really successful in those opening duels and in those opening duel success i think it's largely because he didn't have to do a lot of things by himself he could again just pair up with taps and be part of the main map control group and yeah just really good map control from this team again their defaults are really solid with kusta and bentet playing those solo positions with automatic being that opper who doesn't necessarily have to be that flashy quick firing speed amazing just flashy skill oppers he's like one of those more methodical slow kind of calculated oppers who you know doesn't necessarily take the risky angles but can you know play assertive angles when need be but could also just be kind of that guy that holds the line while Sam and Ben Ted or other people kind of flood in and try to create those openings and he can kind of just hold the angles and 
could make plays at times. He, in his own right, was doing really well in opening duels. He was good at, you know, changing up his starting locations, changing up throughout a round, being dynamic. You could definitely tell that he's a studious guy who, who's probably trying to figure out how to be a dynamic opera and how to be versatile and, and what ways he's used. And so I think that you really saw a lot of that throughout all the mats that they played. So we didn't see that much of them just yet, but I think it was enough to kind of understand that they had their defaults down. They had their roles down. They were able to mix in stuff with different pacing changes and set pieces that varied in how scrimmy or how structured and, and how high the utility usage was and things of that nature. So I think they have a good base right now. I think the only thing that you have to watch out for going forward is can Sam perform like this consistently? Can he really be this good in those opening dual scenarios and being a playmaker and hitting these crazy shots? Because it felt like the dude was just not missing in many of the fights I saw him take uh, throughout the games. I personally commentated at the event, but also just caught uh, eyes on on different demos. Like he, he just seemed like he was out of control throughout this event and you have to wonder is that an overperformance is that something that's sustainable because I think that really will determine how good this team is actually going to be going forward when they have to, they have to play against big, bigger name teams but they beat some top 20 some top 25 ish teams at this tournament I mean Fury is kind of ranked within the top 20 towards top 15 Ents is just outside of top 15 but certainly within the top 20 and then obviously complexity and North kind of find themselves in similar ranking positions to Gen G even they beat some pretty decent top 20-ish teams at the very least. And again, they, they looked really sharp in their strategy. It's just going to be about whether or not individual performances continue because I don't know if Sam will be able to keep up this level of form. I mean, he had some pretty monster numbers and was all over the place in the leaderboards when it came to different, you know, statistical positions. And I just don't know if that'll continue. I think Automatic will probably continue to play pretty well if it's a stable environment where he's happy and he's getting to do things that he wants to do and he's learning along the way. I think you could expect Automatic to still be a pretty solid player going forward. I think that Bentet will probably only get better as time passes for this team. I mean, there was already some talk about there still being some language barrier issues that have to be sorted out. And so right now, I think his input is probably limited, but he has an experience of being an in-game leader. So once he can start having more input in mid-round decision making or maybe adding certain tactics to the playbook, I think he'll only get better. And then I think he'll only start to thrive more and more as he gets more comfortable in his roles and in the spots that he's playing and just working with this team. So I think that you could expect Ben Tet to probably go up in productivity and then Sam will either kind of stay where he's at or maybe he'll drop a bit and then or maybe it'll be kind of up and down i'm not really sure what to expect from him i think kusta will probably be about the same dots will probably be about the same so i think there's definitely chances this team could grow and, and be a really solid team but there's also that situation where was this some type of crazy honeymoon phase shock and all catch everyone off guard type play at this tournament against kind of, you know, decent teams, but not elite level teams. And now people are going to start watching you and then you're going to have to start mixing things up, adding things and try to also remain consistent at the same time. So it's still hard to gauge how how high this team can skyrocket as far as rankings go and as far as making deep runs at, at maybe bigger tournaments in the future or tournaments around the same level as DreamHack Open. But it certainly was still a great debut. I enjoyed their run at Anaheim. I hope this is a sign that they're going to be, you know, developing even more in the future. And they're definitely a team, at least to keep an eye on now. They went from, on my radar, being kind of a, a team that was interesting, but not really something I expected a lot out of, to now I'm intrigued to see how much further they can go. So I hope you folks enjoyed this video. If you did, please subscribe for more content. Catch you next time.